I'm really interested in this stuff. Um, REST and HTTP and, and all of these concepts have been around for a long time, and I'll talk more about that, but for me personally, it was a very practical thing. Um, just as how I got into programming. Programming for me is started out as being a very practical thing. Not that I was interested in programming for its own sake, but I was interested in having programs. So I desired the outcome uh, more than I was just infatuated with the, with the mechanisms. Um, and it was kind of the same thing with REST. Um, back, I think, about three or four years ago, we decided that Basecamp, our premier application at 37 Signals, ought to have an API. APIs were getting popular, and we thought, well, this would be great. We should, we should really have an API. And I did this in the best way I knew how at the time, which was pretty poorly, um, because there wasn't really um, a grand idea. APIs at the time for a lot of people, and certainly for me, were just something you bolted on at the side. There was not an overarching vision or strategy or approach or method you could kind of take. You just grabbed a little bit here and there. It's actually funny that Cal was up here um, just before me in this room because we looked at the Flickr API. And the Flickr API kind of said REST on it. I thought, hey, that, that sounds kind of interesting. We should, we should look at that. I'm hearing that this REST thing is something you should be interested in. Funny thing is, of course, that the, calling the Flickr API REST is, is very much a misnomer. But it, it was a great way of encapsulating that in, what, 2004, not a whole lot of people knew a whole lot about it. Um, and I certainly didn't. And um, So we looked at the Flickr API, we kind of we took some of their ideas, we implemented it just on the side as kind of like a side project, and what I found was that was really unsatisfying. It was kind of the same experience I had with Ajax. So the very first Ajax application I did was something called Tadalist. Uh, at 37 signals, and again it was this thing bolted on the side because we didn't really know. We didn't have a method or an approach or something that we could hold on to that could encapsulate it as part of the development process itself. So it was also always this thing on the side. And as with Ajax, with REST, this felt really unsatisfying. That it wasn't part of the core development approach. Um, and I think this is partly goes back to the origins of, of where REST comes from. Um, and, and REST, of course, is based on HTTP as kind of a, a way of embracing HTTP, um, and that's how you get to, to REST and, and APIs and so forth. Well, the problem with HTTP is kind of, it, it's an ogre. Um, and ogres have layers, um, and, and so do onions, apparently. But we'll stick with the ogre. The, Funny thing about HTTP, it's, it's initially kind of scary. Um, there's, there's this huge spec that's been around for a decade, and most web developers have not read the HTTP spec. And I don't blame them. It's kind of um, long, and it seems like there's a lot of things in it that doesn't really relate to what you do. And most importantly of all, you can get by without it. You don't really need to read the spec to make a web application. Uh, I remember the first, well, we were doing Basecamp, I was thinking at the time. Well, get or post, who, who kind of cares? Um, it doesn't really matter. I can get the application to work in a browser without knowing jack about HTTP. Um, and that's both the strength and the weakness, in my mind, of that protocol. It's so easy to get started that anybody can do it without having any sort of foundation or interest in learning more about what HTTP actually is. But to really uh, embrace it, to go with the RESTful style, to use it more deeply in your application for stuff like APIs, for stuff like multiple formats, you kind of have to dig down a few layers. Um, well, the great thing about HTTP is that, uh, of course, that it, it works in the beginning. You can kind of get started. And then when you get interested in it, it becomes really fascinating. There's all these layers of things, problems you run into along the way as you're scaling, as you're building your application, as you're trying to think more about these concepts, that you think you're running into this for the first time. And of course you're not. There's some really smart guys about 10 or more, 15 years ago, who kind of thought it all out. And that's what's so wonderful about this rediscovering of the HTTP protocol. 
um, is that we're basically, um, we've ignored, ignored the past for so long, most web developers have ignored the past for so long, not caring about all the thought that went into the core protocols of what they, they built on top of, but now they're running into the same problems, how do I do caching, how do I do APIs, how do I do multiple formats, and the answers are all there. It just requires us to, um, to kind of dig down into layers. And that has certainly been uh, a key part of my Ruby on Rails experience, is in some ways it's just a journey of um, rediscovering HTTP, trying to learn what smart people wrote down 15 years ago. Um, and it, it takes time, I'm definitely not done, but it's just, to me it's fascinating how that process works. So, you got HTTP, HTTP is the ogre. Um, now REST has a very closely aligned relationship with HTTP, but it is kind of separate. Um, and, and I like to think of, uh, of REST as, as blue cheese. It's very much an acquired taste. And the first time you try it, it's disgusting. Um, and REST was kind of the same way for me. The first time I, kind of, I read into all of this stuff that is around REST, all the academic parts of it, it was, I mean, first of all, who writes like this? And second of all, why do I care? Why do I have to bother with this stuff? I, I really, I didn't care for the longest time until I start running into all those problems that the people have solved long before me. And then, once you get hooked on it, it's actually really tasty. And the whole REST style, there's all sorts of pieces of the puzzle that just kind of come together. All this notion of having stuff bolted on on the side, it, it kind of fades away and you realize that this is a really well thought out approach. This is kind of a grand unifying theory of what you've been working on for so long. Um, but there's definitely a very harsh initial barrier of entry. Which is why I absolutely don't blame most developers for not giving um, too much thought to it and just doing what works. But I can just tell you as somebody who tasted blue cheese for the first time and hated it, um, once you get a, beyond that, once you acquire that taste, it becomes uh, really fascinating. But looking at those initial barriers, and what are those barriers? Well, the foundations of, of REST and that whole style of development um, comes from the work of a guy named uh, Roy Fielding, who in, in 2000 wrote a dissertation on, on this architectural style, as, um, as he calls REST. Which is already there when you use the words architectural style about something. You're already kind of in, in shaky territory. What does that actually mean? Why do I actually care? And just as an example of, of, of those initial barriers and that kind of coming out of academia um, in many ways disadvantage that REST have had, um, here is the, the opening chapter for, for chapter 5 in, in Roy Fielding's 2000 dissertation. This chapter introduces and elaborates the representational state transfer REST architectural style for distributed hypermedia systems. Describing the software engineering principles guiding REST and the interaction constraints chosen to retain those principles while contrasting them to the constraints of other architectural styles. <laughs> If this was a lecture I was at, I would be IMing right now. Um, and I think that's kind of just a real problem. This is from 2000, before I even thought of getting into web applications. Um, Roy had this whole thing figured out, but nobody could get to it. It was encapsulated in this um, harsh academic shell that you had to break through. And it's just been taking years and years for us as a community to start breaking through, um, through that style. And I think that's kind of a real shame because all of these answers were there. HTTP had a lot of the stuff figured out in 94, 95. Um, Roy was making all of these really interesting, deep, philosophical thoughts on, on how you could use HTTP to build these hypermedia systems uh, in, in 2000s, but, but nobody really got it. And because nobody got it, because it was encapsulated in this academic shell, it left a vacuum. So what are we going to do instead? We don't get what these academic people are talking about. Um, 
there's a room here, there's an, a commercial vacuum for how do we build systems that on the web can talk to other systems. Um, and this is where the evil empire swept in. Um, there's something called WS Star, which is a conglomerate or an empire of, of specs of how to deal and how to connect um, distributed systems which are trying to, or were trying to, kind of hijack HTML or HTTP and the web to, to do their bidding. And they had like all their soap troopers and orchestration destroyers and, and all of these, all of these masks to kind of come in there and scoop up from that vacuum. And they were largely really successful. I remember when I first started looking at the rest stuff, I was like, eh, this is a little weird. People were sending me links to Roy's dissertation, and I would read that first paragraph of chapter five and think, uh, maybe tomorrow or something. Uh, and then I would look at the soap stuff, and the soap stuff would all be neatly packaged and, and kind of ready to use, and people were, it was on, on sites with banners and fancy logos, and you'd think, oh, this, is, this sounds kind of real. This sounds kind of cool. We should kind of do something with that. And it wasn't until you got really kind of started using it, actually, that you found out that this is kind of bad. This, this hurts. This isn't pleasant. What have you guys fooled me into? And you basically wake up on the Death Star and thinking, like, how do I get off? Um, well, that's basically the process that we somewhat had to go through. We had to wake up on the Death Star thinking, this is really not where I want to be. Let me get a pot off this uh, thing ASAP. And it felt like for the past few years, for the past two years or so, there's been like a communal awakening that we have to get off this Death Star and preferably we, we have to blow it up. Uh, because this is really a bad approach for a whole lot of simple problems that are just being attacked by these very overarching, over complex systems that might be right for somebody somewhere, but it sure as hell ain't me. Um, and that's when, when I, I kind of <clears throat> went from the realization of waking up to the Death Star to, to kind of joining the rebels um, and, and trying to just break the uh, academic shelf of Roy's work and promote HTTP and promote REST as being not just this, um, not just a dissertation, but being actual practical stuff that you can use for something. And it seems like it's starting to work. We've definitely um, put a, um, a dent in the death star uh, and we're moving forward as a community. So, with that kind of intro, I kind of want to um, show you a little bit of how this stuff actually work in, works in Rails and, uh, and why, it's, um, why it's interesting. So, we'll try a, a short demo here of some live code. Alright, so, can you read this? Is this good? Yeah? yeah. Alright, so, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a fresh new um, Rails application and I'm going to show you how um, over the past few years, REST have really infiltrated Rails to the point where making a, a Rails application in many ways should be the same as making a nice RESTful application. So, we'll make a new application called Goes REST. We'll use the Rails command for that. Um, that'll create an empty shell for, for a, a new Rails application. And the first thing we want to do, we want to have something. Let's say we want to build a simple blogging system because that's certainly never been done in a demo before. Um, so we're going to generate what Rails calls a scaffold, which is basically a small um, shell of an application. It's going to have these posts. That's what our weblog is going to be made of. Uh, and a post will have a title. And it will have a body. It's going to be text. All right. It's going to generate this, which will give us a small sample application. We don't even need to look at all this stuff. This is kind of the stuff that it generates for us that deals with giving the, um, the web log an interface, the post an interface. Um, it already even created like the database uh, table for us and everything. We can set that up right away. Um, RegDB migrate means that we're going to create the, the database table. We're going to create our 
host's table, and it's going to have that title and that, uh, that body. And basically, in those two steps, we're kind of ready to go. So let's start up Rails and, and have a look. So welcome to Rails. All right, our Rails part kind of worked. Uh, we can see that right now I should have quit my browser before I did this demo. Um, let's do that again. Um, so we're running Rails 2.1.1 right now. Uh, it doesn't really matter. What we're interested in is what we just created. So we created that post interface. And Rails puts a really basic HTML UI around this. So it just has a list of all the posts. There are no posts right now, so let's make a new one. Uh, first post, that's always a popular um, comment for people on blogs. So you gotta have that. Um, and let's actually have a second one that also thinks is the first post. Because that's usually how it goes. All right, great. So we have a few posts. Um, and we've been using this HTML system and underneath actually lies a fairly nice restful application, but you couldn't really tell. Like this could just as well have been done the hackiest way using gets for everything and, and so forth. So let's investigate just a few of those subtle differences. Um, if we look at, for example, the source for this, um, we'll see that when we're updating a comment, or a, or a post, we post back to the same URL that actually shows that post. Well, that's kind of interesting. That's usually not how it's done. That's kind of one of those clues that, that something else would be there. If it was an old Rails style, pre-REST, it would have been something like slash post, slash one, slash show. Because you would have all these actions mapped out. Well, one of the interesting things about REST is that it relies on this notion of a single resource that you can do multiple things to that resource. So what we're doing to this resource is that we're actually doing what's called a put. So REST and HTTP has these four overarching methods, things you can do. It's got the get, which is seeing the resource. It's got the, the post, which is creating the resource for the first time. And then those two are basically the only ones that are exposed through HTML. So most people just stop there. We got the get, we got the post. Well, to actually fully embrace the, the HTTP spec, there's two others. There's put, which is updating or replacing the resource you're working with, and then there's delete, which is destroying the resource. Well, both of those aren't really mapped in, uh, in HTML. HTML just doesn't have those capabilities, and it's a real shame, and I think that's part of what held back this whole adoption of, of HTTP and REST, but we thought, Screw that. We can build it in. It doesn't really matter. So what we've done with Rails is that we'll piggyback the exotic methods, the put and the delete, on top of post. So this is what we do with this hidden input box, which have underscore method as its name, and the value is put. So we're basically, we're simulating the full HTTP spec through HTML using this kind of neat little hack. And if we were just interested in HTML, if HTML was going to be the only client, that would not be worth it. We are doing this because HTML is just one of the clients we have, and it just happens to be a little handicap. So we're giving it a pair of crutches, and it'll go along with the other guys. Anyway. Um, so there's a lot of different URLs that kind of point to the same thing. Um, and if we take a look at what that thing is, Um, we get all of these mappings for how Rails knows where to lead the different things from this guy. So Rails knows uh, about resources and it wants you to follow a resource approach. This map resources post was added uh, by the original scaffold we did to the route file. The route file is kind of like the traffic control person that in comes a request, where does it go? Well in comes a put for a slash post slash one, well, that's an update. Got to route that to the update uh, action in the post controller. So it goes right here. I've actually spelled them out in the, in the comments of where stuff goes. So the way we've implemented REST in Rails is by saying, there's a lot of conventions here. 
That's the great thing. The great thing about uh, REST as a style in HTTP is that it enforces constraints. Treat everything as a single resource. Have those four verbs, as they're called, the get, the post, the, the put, and the delete. And you can do that to anything that exposes it. Well, that's pretty nice because it means that that mapping is something that we can encapsulate in a pattern, in a convention, and then now, whenever I'm building my controllers in, in Rails, I know that if I just call my things, these things, index is for the get on the, uh, uh, on the collection. Uh, a get on this individual resource goes to the show. All these things are mapped out for me. I don't have to spell any of this stuff out. Um, that's pretty neat. Well, this is kind of behind the scenes stuff. What is REST really giving me? Well, I'll, I'll go into more. There's actually a lot of benefit to be had just from these conventions just from knowing that everything we'll design and mapping our system will be a single URL and we'll point different verbs at it. But, alright, the user doesn't really care. How do we get something that the, the user can use? Well, an interesting thing is when we created this application from the scratch, the scaffold kind of gives us a hint of where we could go. So the first thing you can do is you can get an XML representation of any of these resources. So if we go to the XML, .xml on the URL, we get this. We get a neatly formatted piece of XML presented to us from the same resource. We're basically seeing exactly the same thing we were seeing on the web interface. We just see it in an XML format. And we're seeing it from the same resource, from the same URL, slash posts. We just add .xml. We get it in an XML <coughs> format. Well, how does that work? So, Another thing that's kind of we discovered as part of this REST and HTTP thing was the whole notion of multiple representations. Um, and this is where it was really interesting for me and where it was different from the API work I've done in the past. Whenever I wanted to expose an XML <coughs> thing, I'd build another thing. I'd build another controller. I'd build like the API controller. And that would have an XML representation of the post. And it'd be separate from everything else. But I was kind of doing the same work again. I still needed the same objects from the database. I still needed the same uh, posts to present them. They were just in a different format. Why do I have to recreate all of this work again just to get something in a different representation? Well, uh, REST and HTTP really take that off in my mind. This is the same thing. This is the same resource. I want exactly the same thing. I just want you to show it to me in a different format. Well, Rails encapsulates this in the notion of respond to. So this single action as it comes out of the box from scaffold, can respond to HTML and to XML. When it responds to HTML, it'll use this, um, this template, and that's like a regular template from any kind of um, uh, web framework. It has interpolation of Ruby and HTML, that's all good and fine, but when the client comes in and says, I want XML, we'll do something else. What we'll do here is we'll render XML, and we have a lot of kind of conventions where we can just give it a collection of objects. It'll turn that collection of objects into XML right there. Kind of neat. All right, we can have XML. We're actually a good step along the way to having a full-on API, a full-on RESTful API for our brand new application, and we've done essentially nothing to get there. Pretty cool. Well, there's a lot of other formats. XML is not the only one. What if we wanted JSON, for example? Say you're building a, a, an Ajax client or something else and you want to be cool and hip with the young and, and you want to use JSON, of course, because XML is kind of all hat now, right? So we could, we could try that. Um, we could try to get an XML representation. I'm going to use a command line client here to, to query the same web application just so you can see what goes on underneath. And I actually I primarily want you to show you this because I want you to see the headers coming back. This is where it gets a little kind of technical. But doesn't matter. So we'll go to the same application, ellipse says local host, ellipse says post. Well, I want JSON now. I, I want another format for exactly the same thing, just to suck out the XML, I want the JSON now. Well, it says you, you can't add it. 406, not acceptable. That's HTTP's way of saying, well, yeah, you asked for this in JSON, well, I ain't got it. So tough luck. So you're just going to get nothing. You're going to get a status back saying, I don't have that. Which is kind of cool, because it means that you can query these resources if everybody was actually doing it like this, and you can kind of ask them for different formats, and you'd get back, all right, don't have this format, you'd know, well, the resource is there, I just don't have this format. 
let, it, let, us, let us gift them this format. So we'll add the JSON format. It'll basically do exactly the same thing as the um, SDX uh, XML version. It'll just say, I, I want it in, in JSON instead. Now, what's going to happen when we ask for it in JSON? Boom, we get it in JSON. Right here is exactly the same thing as you just saw in XML in JSON. And now it says 200 OK. 200 OK is HTTP's ways of saying, yes, what you ask for, I deliver. That's pretty cool, but again, it's kind of like developer each. Like most guys really don't care that much about it. What users care about is feeds. They care about our Seth or, or Adam or something else like a feed. Like how would we get a feed? Exactly the same thing again. Our web log already provides three different formats, three different representations. It's got the uh, HTML, it's got the XML, it's got the JSON. Let's give it some, some Atom too. So we'll add the, uh, the Atom format. The Atom format is a little bit more involved. You can't just take a collection and turn it into Atom because there's decisions in what you propose to <coughs> feed, what's the feed supposed to be called. Well, we have some stuff to help you in Rails, luckily. Uh, I'll make a new file here. It's going to be an index file, meaning it's exactly the same. Action, I'm hitting as the HTML, I'm just going to hit the index. Now instead of HTML, this is what the other file was called, I'm going to make it Atom. So Rails have this way of dividing up an index or a template file. First, you ask for what action is it. Second, which MIME type are we talking about? Which type of content are we talking about? We're talking about Atom. And which template engine do you want to use to build it? Well, here we want to use something called Builder. It doesn't really matter what it is. And I have pre-cooked a little thing here. Um, and we'll shoot it in. So we have a little bit of a helper in Rails, a, like a mini DSL, a mini language for describing Atom feeds and how they work. Here it's going to be, my feed is going to be the greatest blog, blah, blah, blah. It was last updated by the time the last post was created. It iterates over all these posts and kind of create them uh, as an Atom feed. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, we see we've mapped it out as the Atom. When we just do format Atom, it automatically look for index.atom whatever template engine you want. Um, so it'll automatically find it. We don't have to configure this or wire this up in any way. Now, if we go to this again, we can just change it to Adam. Not Adam. Boom. Our Adam feed. Well, most people won't be reading their RSS feeds like this. So let's actually make it kind of useful for, for end users. To do that, we will first go to... Um, the, the layout for, for the HTML setup, and we'll do something called yield cat, which is a way of including another piece of HTML. This doesn't really matter, from somewhere else. And then in our index HTML file, we will uh, we'll basically inject a, what's called a, um, a link href to that H, uh, Atom feed we just created. We want the formatted, this is how we call it, this is how we know what we refer to. We want the formatted post path. The post path is for the index of our application, like the HTML list of all the, uh, uh, of all the posts, and we just want that in the Atom form. All right, that's great. Let's go back to our application, reload. Now you see this little icon up here? That's a really cool thing that all the browsers started doing some time back, where if you insert this special link href, the browser will pick it up, and the user will be presented with basically, hey, this site you're looking at right now, it's got an RSS feed, or even though it's an, an Atom feed. And if we click that, boom, we have our basically using the in-browser feed reader for this, and we have an Atom feed for what we're doing. Well, pretty damn cool. Now, in almost no work at all, we now support four different formats a full-on API, a full-on API in XML, and in JSON, and we provide a, an Atom feed for it. And you could add anything you want to this, and we often do. So, for example, you want your files, in, you, know, you want your post in CSV file, you add that. You want your post in, in RSS as well, you don't just want to add Atom, you add that. You want your post in iCal format because you want them on a calendar, and when they were posted, you add an iCal format. All of these things in the past, how I would have done it, would have been created a brand new thing, something separate from the entire application, just so I could provide the iCal of the RSS or, or so forth. Well, this is only kind of half of the, the solution. 
what we want too is we want to be able, for this API, to be able to post something. We want to be able to get something into our application. Now we can read from our error API, but to get something in, let's try to use this curl thing. So we'll basically say, um, I'm making a new request. The content type of what I'm sending you is going to be XML. Um, and I'm going to send you this. I'm going to send you this. Actually, I have this all written out. Let me be lazy here. Uh, So I'm going to send you this. I'm going to send you a new request with curl. It's going to be in XML. You see the XML here? It's the post, the title. Uh, it's got the body. We're posting it to the same URL as we were reading it from, which is, again, part of that whole nice resource idea where everything has a single URL and you can do multiple things to it. First, we read from it. We got the XML from it. Now we post to it because we want to insert another object into that collection, again, using exactly the same structure. We'll post that. And we basically get back the HTML, or the XML of how it'll look in the real version. Because it'll add like the created ad, it'll add the ID, and so on and so forth. If we go back to our feed, it's right there. We just added something to that collection. Pretty neat. Um, now, not all or everybody's going to send like a nicely formatted request. Sometimes the API, and part of building an API is making sure that people send stuff that you want. So if we take another look at this post, we'll say, actually, a post is not really a post um, if it doesn't have a title. So it's got to have a title. Let's add that constraint in to what we're doing. Now, if we try to send exactly the same thing here as we were just doing, and we yank out the title, and we're not sending the title, I'll actually just do get the I in here so we get the headers. I sent the same thing. Ooh, I get a or two, two back. Unprocessable entity. Basically means what you sent, yeah, it's kind of all right, but it's not quite there. You gotta retry again, and there's something wrong with it, and we'll send you the errors down here. It says, title can't be blank. Okay, that's pretty cool. How did that actually happen? What, what's the process for that? So let's take a look at the post controller here. Take a look at the create action, which is where the stuff gets redirected to. And you can kind of see there's two paths here. When we respond to the client of, of what he's getting back, there's one path if the post saves, if it's successful. If all the validations are fulfilled and so on, we'll say, oh, it was successfully created, we'll redirect to the post if you're in HTML mode. If you're in XML mode, we'll render the XML. That was what we just saw before when we created it successfully. We'll say it was successfully created. That's called the 201. And um, the location of the new thing you just created, here it comes to you. Um, it has, again, one of those conventions of saying, if I just give you a, a post, it'll automatically look up what the URL is for that post and, and send it to you. Great. Now, if it doesn't work, if, if there's something wrong with it, in HTML mode, we'll send you back to the form. We can actually do that right now. We'll send you back to the form and we'll say, uh, what the F? Oh. That's too clever. All right, we'll go back to the interface here, and if we just try to submit it, we get exactly the same thing. <laughs> so see, this is how we kind of reuse functionality. Both the HTML version and the XML version have to validate that the stuff that they have coming in is right. Um, and this is the same, basically, we were doing this in XML just before when we got the can't uh, create blank thing. All right, so we've got these different paths. This is all good. Um, now, most people are not going to make their API in just curl. Like, curl is like command line thing, it's great for testing, it's great for showing stuff, but most people, when they think of an API, they think of something that's a little bit more automated, something they can kind of encapsulate. This was what SOAP really won on in the beginning, this notion of tooling. I don't even have to worry about all of these intricate details because I can just drag and drop in Visual Studio and everything will work until it doesn't and then you have no effing clue what went wrong. And this is kind of one of those beauties of REST and HTTP. This stuff is so simple. We're doing Lego blocks right now. We understand what's going on underneath. We're doing the actual HTTP calls. This is not all abstracted away because it doesn't need to be all abstracted away. This is what I truly hate about tall abstractions. When you don't understand what's going on at the fundamental layer, you're, as Joel Spolsky, you have a leaky abstraction. When something goes wrong in Visual Studio, 
when something is returned wrong, you have no clue how to fix it because you don't know what you're looking at. Because soap is so complex that humans aren't meant to understand it. HTTP was written for humans. It's spelled out. It's actually way more explicit than it needs to be. If you look at the status code, when something says 201, I mean, it could just say 201 and the computer would know what it meant. But in HTTP, you actually say 201 created. Like there's a little bit of human information there because you're supposed to read these things. This is what I really love about the whole REST approach. It's so simple that you're supposed to understand it. Um, now, let's look at, uh, if we make an API, we basically want to encapsulate all this stuff in the API. In Rails, we provide something called Active Resource, which is a, an abstraction that builds on top of the same principles. And many of these principles, the great thing about them are that they're conventions. We can kind of agree on them once, and we don't need to do a whole lot of configuration. We don't need to do whistles, we don't need to do all this tall abstraction crap that they need to do on the Death Star. Um, instead, three lines is all we need to currently map that post we were just interacting with before over curl through, um, through Ruby. And we'll map it as API post. So if we do, we now have an object. An object we can work with as though we were using um, just a database. Let's say we want to find the, the first post. Boom, we get an object back. What happened here? This is the, the law for Rails. So it got a request in for show because it was a get on slash post slash one. The format came in as XML. So under the covers, this stuff is using XML. Um, and now we have an object back. We can take this object and say, what's your title? Oh, it's first post. What's your body? First. Well, we can change all this stuff. So let's take the title and um, say it's not really a first post. Still just have an object, we're still just working with an object. Now if we take that object and we <coughs> save it, true, all right, it happened. It, what happened under the covers? It went back to the post controller. It knew that it just had to do a put on the same URL as it had before. It was doing it in the XML format and it was sending this stuff back. It updated it in the database. Everybody's happy and if we go to Yes, not really a first post. So we now have a basically a full-on API. We can do whatever we want. We can even destroy this. If we do a destroy, it failed. Uh, why did it fail? <laughs> All right, we're supposed to be able to do a destroy. Maybe we should do a, did we find it? I should have tested that part, shouldn't I? Um, all right, you're supposed to be able to do a destroy here. It doesn't really matter. Um, what you can do too is, not everything maps to just those four basic methods. Like, a lot of things can just be represented by get, you get to see what's there. Uh, uh, post, you get to create a new one of whatever it is that's there. Put, you get to update whatever is there. Um, delete, you get to destroy whatever is there. Well, this is somewhat how regular object-oriented programmers get, kind of get their mind blown a little bit. Well, this is cramping my beautiful object model. What about all these other methods I have that doesn't map in this CRUD model? Uh, what do I do about that? Well, first of all, most of the time, you're just being lazy. You're being a bad um, modeler if you can't express it within these constraints. In many ways, what I love most about it, and I'll return to this in a second, is the notion that REST is not just about how you structure your application for the outside world. It's also a liberating set of constraints for how you model your uh, stuff on the inside. The model I always bring up is saying, you have an author model. This guy writes books, so author has many books. Well, how do you create this association? Well, a book can have many authors, and, and, and uh, an author can have many books. It doesn't really matter. There's something missing there. So usually you'd have on your author uh, model, you'd have something like, add author to a book and you take in a book and that would kind of create a connection. There's something that's kind of missing there, but it doesn't matter as long as you're in the object world because, I mean, who cares? Just add another method to your object. Well, in the REST world, you'd have to kind of break that out. And that's what I really loved about the, the whole REST set of glasses. That when I looked at that problem was, I can't really figure out how do I add this add 
um, author to the book method. It doesn't, it's not a get, it's not a put. Um, how, how do I map it in? What I realized was, well, there's just a model missing here. I can map this, let's call it authorship. If I represent authorship as its own thing, I can do my four things again. I can create an authorship, which links a, a, an author with a book. I can update that authorship. It can even include metadata. When was this authorship created? When does it start? How much money was involved? Like all of these things kind of come out because my domain was enriched. I got a better language to talk about what I was doing. And I got it all because I was forced to, which is what's so great about these constraints. They make you think harder about your domain. Well, doesn't always work. Sometimes there will be exceptions. Sometimes there will be methods that just doesn't fit. And you can add your own stuff to it. Um, if we go down back to the, the rush thing, what we can do here is say, all right, this will just give me the standard four. That's fine. I want one more. I want a special thing on the members. So on an individual post, I want to be able to say publish. Um, true. Not true. Publish is just going to be a post action. I don't care. It doesn't fit, but this is what I have to do. And that's kind of the pragmatism I think we injected in the whole REST setup with Rails. That sometimes you're just not smart enough to, or in depth enough in your modeling um, that you can come up with authorship. It doesn't seem like whatever you're working on right now doesn't have that unexposed model. So you can't do it. It doesn't matter. There's a valve, there's a release valve, there's like an exit door. You can't go on, you can't go back to your old ways of just piggybacking uh, RPC over, over this REST style. And you can map all this up and you can add it into your API and it, it's fine. I tried to do this as the, the last kind of way out. Um, I prefer not to do it, but, but if we have, uh, if we must, we will. And I think this is part of that shift where it went from the academic kind of you must do this always at all times, otherwise you're damned to the, I'd like to do this most of the time for most of the things, and I'll derive great value from that, but sometimes I can't. Big deal. All right. That's kind of the demo. So let's look at some of the other uh, benefits you kind of get from this. Kind of talked about this already. Convention over configuration. Um, this whole notion that when we were building this entire app that just made like, have a, a XML, JSON, uh, API interface, it does Atom, it does a lot of these things. We almost did no, or not almost, we did no configuration. There was no saying, well, this thing is supposed to be called that in the URL. We weren't mapping these things out. We weren't making these choices ourselves, because it didn't matter. All these choices basically just assume you want a URL that's like slash post slash one. That's fine. That's a great way to start. If you don't care about the URL, everything would just work. And I think that's probably the, that's the biggest thing I've gotten out of, um, out of REST, is another set of conventions. Ruby on Rails itself is all about conventions. It's all about saying you shouldn't explicitly configure how the database talks to the object model and so on. Let's just agree on kind of how it's supposed to be. And then as long as you follow along that path, it just works. Well, we're doing the same thing now with REST, just on a higher level. Before we did it in the database with the object model. Now we're doing it with the controllers uh, and the URLs and the, and the interface to your application. We're lifting those conventions up one more step, giving you another boost of productivity of not having to make all these decisions over and over again, and giving you just more consistency. Now, when I drum, jump from one Rails application to another inside of 37 signals, all our controllers look the same. They got the index, they got the show, they got the destroy, they got all of these things because they're mapped in the same straitjacket. And that's really great for programmers not to be able to readjust themselves with what this other guy made of decisions that just didn't matter in the end. Whether you call something destroy or delete or purge or blow up, it doesn't matter. Just pick one, for God's sake, and then we can just assume that decision is done. Let's move on to more interesting things. So this is how it used to look uh, in, in Rails. Everything was mapped out as an individual action. We were doing updates and destroy just over post. With REST, it just maps to a much simpler setup. The URLs are much simpler, they're much prettier too, if you care about that stuff. Um, and it's just a convention that it's always gonna look like this. This was just kind of a loose convention. Everybody kind of came up with, they called their show display, or as I was talking about before. Uh, it was decisions every time. Decisions just didn't matter. Um, and this is how it kind of 
with REST, it maps to what we're already doing. So here you're looking at two layers, find, create, update, and destroy. It's kind of like method names we would call in the object model. And that maps to kind of the, the SQL underneath, the database call we would make. Those would be select, insert, update, and clean. Hey, there's a, like, this is kind of nice mapping here. The REST layer just sits neatly on top of that. So for most things, most of the time, when it's just CRUD, you get get to map to find, to map to the select. It's, it fits. It's not this bolted on thing. It fits in our neat little schema here. And once we internalize that, we don't have to kind of deal with it again. It gives you a way of spotting natural borders. So the problem with before this stuff, um, how much stuff do we have to have live under the post? If I look at the original message controller we have in, in, in Basecamp, it did all worlds of stuff. It was about showing the messages, it could create comments for those messages, it could deal with the categories, and like this file was 500 lines long because there was no natural border. When do I stop? When everything is just another method, when there's no pushback, you just add another method, of course. So this is basically looking at probably the worst controller we have in Basecamp right now. It has even like the perfect worst controller name, global controller. What the hell does global control mean? It basically means big trash can for stuff I couldn't shove in anywhere else. Um, and it does all sorts of stuff here. It controls the appearance of your, of your account, it deals with the default categories, it even deals with invoicing, it deals with all of these things. And it didn't used to be like this. It used to have like four things that it did. You could set your appearance, you could get your account information, you could target the newsletter. Well, that seems kind of fair that it don't do those three things. But it was called global control, so whenever we had an idea we couldn't fit anywhere else, shove it right in. REST provides kind of a mental wall for that. Like, hey, I'm shoving in a lot of things that should be their own resources. Dealing with default categories, what the hell does that have to do with invoices? Those things are separate um, entities. In other words, separate resources. In other words, I could put it in this resource, resource bucket where default controllers, I could create a default controller, I could destroy the default controller, I could list the default controller. Once you put on those glasses and look at your code, you'll just see this really, I mean, this is just a mishmash. All these things fit neatly in their own little boxes. So this is pretty terrible. Um, and I just, I kind of like having it there just as a reminder of how bad stuff used to be. Because this controller is seriously also like three or four lines long. And wherever we have to touch it, it's just, shake our heads and shove another thing right in there. Well, for high rise, um, this REST idea was kind of alive at that time. So high rise is kind of like our CRM-ish thing, and uh, what we do there is we have recordings and subjects. Recordings are things like emails and notes or tasks about a given subject, and a subject itself is then a person or a company or a case. And all of these things just map so nicely. High rise was the first I was really the birth of REST for me because this was the new application where I thought there's no effing way I'm going to do the same thing I did for Basecamp when it comes to API. It's got to be baked in from the beginning. I do not want to go through that crap again. So HiRise was started with the idea that it had to have an API from the beginning. It had to have RSS feeds from the beginning, all of these things. So it became a test bed for this. And these are two examples of controllers I created in HiRise. So much better, so much easier to deal with. Multiple formats, we already talked about this. This is a great insight from the whole RESTful thing. That a single resource, a single entity in your program often wants to be shown in different formats. This is kind of what, how it was before. We had all of these indexes and we would map them to different actions and kind of just annoying. Now we have a much cleaner system. A three-way split. First, which action you're talking about? Index, show, whatever. Which mind type are you talking about? And which template engine are you using? And especially the mind type part that's kind of interesting here, that you can add any mind type on top of the actions you're working on. And when it's so natural, when there's a naming condition on how to do it, you just do it. There's no, it's, it's not, it's no hassle in adding an add-on feed. Like the system already kind of promotes you to do it. Um, instead of treating it like, oh, that's a feature we'll launch in version two or whatever. Um, all right. So this is an example of how we would use to do that before. We'd have a dedicated controller, which wasn't about a thing itself. It was about its mechanism. It was about its format, which is a terrible way of mapping these things. And we'd have a feed controller that'd be responsible for the RSS. Uh, it would be responsible for the ICAL. It would be 
responsible for all these other formats. And it was just a bad way of doing it. Now instead we have this high rise again. Just have the recording controller. And in this instance, it just needs to show itself in HTML and in Atom. It's just very natural to add that in. Uh, the same thing on the suckers control. And here's actually a little bit more exotic. We have a, a B card. So uh, it's a CRM thing, and oftentimes you want B cards out. You want a B card of a given person. Well, well, a B card is just another format. It's just another way of presenting the same person. Just as you would present them in HTML, you can now present them as a B card. Um, pretty nice. All right. Some of the features that Rails does for this stuff, um, not everything maps neatly to that map dot resources post, and then you just get those three. Sometimes you have to do other stuff. So, for example, um, here we have probably one of the more advanced examples. We have, we have products, but we're actually talking about the admin interface for those products, which is different from the products we want to show to the public. So we have an admin interface for these products. We kind of want to look at them in different ways, like there's a way of looking at the inventory, say, of these products, how many do we have of them, so on and so forth. Uh, we can duplicate a single um, product. Duplicate is, again, one of those weird things that you I guess you could kind of map it as a regular resource. You would first like copy what you had, and then you just create no one. Too much of a hassle. Sometimes you just you break those barriers. You just say, "F it, those four um, actions not enough. I want to duplicate right here because it, it makes things easier for me." You have the notion of sub um, collections. So a product can have tags, it can have images, it can have variants, and and those things kind of live underneath the products, and it can have a single cell. Um, so there's a lot of work that's gone into, which is why I, I like what we have now in, in Rails is this is the product of two years or more of people trying to create RESTful applications, hitting every single barrier of this is where it doesn't quite fit, this is where we need an, a release valve, this is where we need to do something else, this is where like the academic perfect world notion doesn't fit well with the other constraint we have, which is we want this to be nice for developers. We do not want it to be more work to create a RESTful application than it is to create a quote unquote regular application. Cool. Um, we have this notion of uh, deep or shallow um, URLs. So sometimes you want like the really deep ones. You want slash users, slash one, slash articles, slash one, slash comments. So of user number one, of the articles he wrote, um, these are the comments. These things can get kind of long. In the beginning, I was really infatuated by long URLs. Like this is part of the, the UI and people can like just delete the last comments bit and they just get like the article and it, nobody really do that. What they do is they send emails and when their URLs in the emails break, if they go to the next line, their URL doesn't work and they write support and I get why doesn't it work. So I realized that kind of like the purity of just having long nice URLs was not worth the they don't work in emails kind of trade off. So we now have this in Rails 2.2, this notion of saying, I just want them shallow. So when you're referring to the comments of Article 1, you really, you're talking about something very specific. It doesn't, you don't need the user in there to kind of quantify which comments you're talking about. So shallow is a way of mapping this nice, nice neat, deep hierarchy of, of, um, of resources, but still accessing them in email-friendly ways. Again, this is one of those very pragmatic things that came up from a very concrete problem of emails don't work well with long URLs. Um, here's another thing that's really cool. We've been working on a lot lately. So Jason just across the um, hall was talking about, we're in, in, at 37 seconds, we're thinking about what are the things that don't change? What are the things we should be focusing a lot of time on in our web applications? What do people always want? What do they want now and five, 10 years from now? What do they want today? Somebody wants Facebook widgets. I don't think they want that in 10 years. Um, today, they want speed. They want a fast application. What do they want in 10 years? They probably don't want a slow application. So speed is probably one of those things we should be investing in because it's kind of a thing that will always be there and it's something that will always be an advantage. Now, we're trying to pull this in in the RESTful uh, approach because one of the beauties of HTTP is that it's built for internet scale. It's built for really big systems that have really a huge amount of uses. How do you deal with that? What's the one thing in computer science we do with that problem? We cache. You can't generate all this stuff over and over and over again every time somebody hits something. So HTTP has a great way of caching, which is a two-pronged approach, something called last modified and e-tags, which are ways of tagging the content that's coming down to the browser 
or the browser is requesting the dashboard page again, but he just saw it five minutes ago. Nothing changed since then. We don't need to recreate all of this dashboard stuff, send it down the wire, and so on. This is a big secret behind how Basecamp feels really fast right now. Because we implemented laugh modified and e-tagging such that there's a ton of requests coming from the users that don't need to regenerate all this stuff again and so forth. And we encapsulated this so when you get a, you have a show action, what's the one thing that dictates whether this show action should be rendered or not? Whether it's new to the user or not? It's whether he's seen this post before. Whether he's seen it since it was last published. So we set the, to the response. Um, this is when it was last published. The e-tag is kind of like a hash of what the post itself looked like. If the request coming in kind of have those details already, fine. We don't need to send it. We can just do a head not modified. It means we're sending nothing down the tube. We can stop uh, creating this stuff again. It's just, it's phenomenal. And it's kind of one of those things that, yeah, you can kind of do that always, but being into this restful mindset leads you down this path of exploring all the HTTP features available to you. Here's basically doing the same thing, just abstracting a little bit, just with like kind of a bow. You wouldn't want this everywhere. We try and play with ways we can abstract this. We'll probably find up some uh, way of doing that. Doesn't really matter. Here's just another kind of interesting thing. So um, we added um, HTTP authentication. I used to think of HTTP authentication being this stupid drop-down box of username and password where I couldn't save Remember Me because it was kind of feature that's built into HTTP. And in large parts, it's often useless for individual users, but it's great for APIs. APIs don't want to navigate an HTML form, um, and the HTTP, um, APIs, you still want to authenticate, you still want to know who's making the request and so on, so we use um, HTTP authentication, and we have this really nice, just a single call you can make, all this stuff is wrapped up. Again, coming from peeling back the layers of HTTP, getting interested in the blue cheese and digging deeper and, and finding all these nuggets just of great stuff that was there for, for decades. We don't need to reinvent. The cookie store uh, is not really interesting. Um, here's another thing that's kind of like, when you look at this, it looks a little bit like repetition. Like, this is what you get from the scaffold. Like, you see all this again and again and again. Like, this doesn't feel rest or Rails-like. Why, why is all this uh, repetition there? It's not very dry. Well, my argument is that your code will never look like this. You'll always have exceptions. You'll always change this. This is just what you start with. But if you do actually have code that looks like this, there's a great project called um, Make Resourceful, which is a plugin for Rails that you could reduce all this stuff we saw before to just this call. It does mean, though, if you need to do something different, it's kind of a little bit heavy. But some, sometimes you just want a vanilla expose a resource and you can do it from the show. 